he ever were to like fill up a car, I'm not sure he actually fills up his car, but you got to admit, the economy now in the United States, substantially better than when the Republicans had it. And I'm not just saying George W. Bush. Remember, when he was in the White House, illegally and illegitimately, for most of that time, he had the Republicans in control of both houses of Congress. And there it is. I mean, they ran the government. And what did they do? took us into a fraudulent war in Afghanistan, trashed the economy, he drove us into a depression, we had to bail out the banks, right? They're spending ever more money on bombing. George W. Bush let let the 9-11 attacks happen. I mean, so here you go. You've got a, an almost complete Democratic two-term administration. You had the George W. Bush complete two-term Republican administration. And look at the difference in the economy. It's obvious the Democrats know how to handle handle the economy and the Republicans don't. And the evidence is right in front of your face. If you are going to be fiercely independent, if you're going to work with the facts and live with the truth, then you've got to reckon with the facts as they are today. And you've got to reckon with the facts that existed when George W. Bush was slinking out of the White House with the economy literally collapsing all around his ears. There's the economy. That'll hire Mark. Hey, Norm, it's Mark Taylor Canfield. Good hey, to Mark. To you again. Hey, congratulations on getting rid of Shell uh, Arctic oil drilling, man. You guys did a fantastic job. Yeah, after spending $4 billion just to lobby for the permits, yeah, the Shell Oil Corporation has just decided to walk away from the coast of Alaska there after 500 kayak activists surrounded, you know, the Polar Pioneer in Seattle, their drilling rig, and... The state, the county, and the city kept telling them that it was illegal to even have that drilling rig in, in Elliott Bay. So, yeah, it's been a big story up here, and the activists are, especially Greenpeace, because they've been calling for a uh, sanctuary on the North Pole to prohibit any kind of oil drilling because of this um, global climate change issue. It's been a big victory, and the activists here are claiming a victory for the planet. So I guess there's... There's an example of how activists can actually get something done. My hat is off to you and your friends in in Portland who were rappelling down the bridge to try and keep the thing from going, that, that big uh, icebreaker from going out into the ocean. I mean, it was all the attention of all the good people in Seattle and Portland that really helped to draw national attention to this. And then when Shell finally got up there and they drilled more than a mile down and they found a little bit here, a little bit there, they said, you know what? All these billions of dollars, all this aggravation, nah, we're going to give up. And I, I, I congratulate each and every person uh, who was opposed to this and who fought this thing. We Finally, we won one, and it was a big one. And, Mark, I don't think we should let all the crush of the uh, of the news headlines with the news cycle uh, uh, push that one down, because that's a massive one. When Shell gave up in the Arctic, to me, for the next several years at least, if not a lot longer, the entire oil industry has given up on the Arctic. Yes, it's been a major focus of my journalism. I'm actually writing a column at the Capitol Hill Times now, so I guess the editors figure it's okay to give a loudmouth a column. And I'm still <laughs> working on putting together my own show, which means I'm as crazy as you, right? Yeah, you <laughs> really are. No question about that. you got to be crazy to get into this business these days. Well, there's been a lot of other news stories, too. The president of the world's largest communist country with a terrible human rights record was meeting in Seattle with the wealthiest capitalists in the world, like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. So that was definitely a story full of contradictions. And then there is a, I wanted to let you know, too, there's a really shocking Seattle Times investigative news report, and they did great journalism on this, showing that 213 people have been killed in Washington State since 2005 by police, with Whoa. one one conviction out of all of those incidents. So that's been another big story in the Northwest, too, is, you know, what is going on with police accountability Apparently, according to Amnesty International, Washington State has the weakest laws in the country in terms of prosecuting uh, police for the use of deadly force. So that's been another issue that people have been talking about. And sad, you know, hearing the, about the story in Oregon and the whole idea of, you know, the wild, wild west is just not very civilized. And I keep thinking about Benjamin Franklin, you know, saying that, well, you know, the United States is a little less civilized and a little more violent than Europe. So sometimes I wonder when I hear stories like this. It's been a real sad story. Both of those stories have been really tragic to hear in the, in the Northwest.
Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, the the environmental community, for lack of a better term, was able to organize itself and fight against Keystone XL. And look at it. We, we got the president to basically do a pocket veto on the thing. I mean, he's just sitting on it until it's squashed. So the Keystone XL looks like it's been scuttled. Uh, the, the Arctic oil drilling has been scuttled. I mean, the environmental messaging by the environmental community in the United States has been very good. We've gotten, by and large, the American people to get it that smog is bad and air pollution is bad and we got to get off fossil fuels. We've done a very good job on, on educating people and raising their consciousness on this. Mark, what do we need to do to get guns that same kind of attention, respect, and energy? How do we do it? I mean, if we did it with the environment and we're, doing, we're still doing well with the environment, how, how do we do it on guns? Well, what I noticed with the Shell story is that a lot of what we consider, besides Greenpeace, a lot of what would be considered very mainstream environmental groups, including the Sierra Club and the Audubon Society, got behind that campaign to stop the Arctic oil drilling. So one of the things that I noticed is that a lot of the activism groups were speaking with one voice very clearly and repeatedly. And also, you had uh, elected officials who were siding with the protesters, and actually we had city council members asking protesters to show up at the port because they felt that their hands were tied in dealing with this big multi-billion dollar multinational corporation. They were fining the Shell Oil Corporation $5,000 a day for uh, having their oil rig, uh, drilling rig in Wash in uh, Elliott Bay illegally. But you know, to Exxon, that was a drop in the bucket, sure. and they really didn't care. So large, largely, I think it was that people were speaking very forcefully and very consistent, consistently with one voice on the issue. There really wasn't much debate. There weren't many people saying that drilling in the Arctic uh, it was a great uh, idea. A great Let's idea. do lots yeah. of that. <laughs> right. Nobody really had that point of view. It was mostly, you know, uh, an issue with money. It was an issue with, you know, can the oil companies uh, squeeze some more oil out of the Arctic and then... You know, the other issue that people didn't talk about besides, or haven't lately, but was a big part of the, the argument was the oil spills. You know, we saw what happened at the Valdez spill, and I talked to a biologist who says there's still oil in, oh, yeah. in the, on the beaches up there. There's still oil. They did a things, so. terrible job on that cleanup, and they just abandoned it at the end. And the Supreme Court went and gave them a big favor by cutting their uh, punitive damages down to nothing. And that's one of the reasons why President Obama delayed the drilling operation because there was a, uh, a support vessel that had some maintenance problems that had to go back to Portland. And so most experts were saying that if even the Coast Guard was saying that they did not have the resources available in that very isolated, difficult area to work to deal with an oil spill. These are very, very rough seas, very extreme temperatures. And so, you know, it's not like what happened in the Gulf, you know, where you can surround the oil rig with all of these support ships. This is a place where it's difficult to even get to, right. let alone clean up an oil spill. Right. So that was a major, major issue, too, that right. I think people jumped on. Mark, I think you're right. There's not a lot of, you know, there's basically the oil companies on the side of the drilling, and then there's everybody else, except for the sycophants on behalf of the oil companies. Uh, but with guns, obviously, there is a much, much more organized pro-gun group, so it's a different dynamic. I appreciate that analysis, Mark, and I think you're right, so I'm going to adopt your point of view. i got to move along. If you're on hold, you're straight ahead. one 321 6001 I've got Republican Civil War Watch for you in 20 minutes where justice is served. The Norman Goldman Show. What are you going to say to me, Norman? Norman. I will not let us forget about Afghanistan. The empire continues to bleed resources and human blood there in Afghanistan, and I never hear from the pro-lifers talking about they want to stop this. This is the Norman Goldman Show. With my tank, I go back to the business. We've become numb to this. I'm not a masochist. court has said very consistently that even constitutional rights can be regulated. 
They've said it in the context of Roe versus Wade. They've said it in the context of guns. There is no question that First Amendment rights to free speech can be regulated. You said the great, the classic example yourself about you can't shout fire in a crowded theater, even if there's, I mean, if there's a fire, you certainly ought to be shouting it. But if there's no fire, you can't be doing that. And Chris, I got to tell you, your phone is totally going on me. Your phone is like strobing here. I know it's a cell phone. I get it. The technology doesn't just vex and harass and annoy me. It vex, harasses, and annoys everybody. So I apologize. I got to let you go because your phone is just like, I can't work with it. I need a better connection. But the bottom line here is, and I also disagree on your Ninth Amendment uh, analysis. I got to say, you cited the Ninth Amendment as saying that people can't hurt others' rights. That's not what the Ninth Amendment's about. The Ninth Amendment simply says that because we have, just because we here in these, uh, in the Bill of Rights have enumerated a variety of rights, that doesn't mean and it's the end of the rights. And incidentally, I mean, that's what they said, because they were concerned that the founders of this nation were concerned that by listing a variety of rights to free speech, free exercise of religion, free assembly, right to be free of search and seizure in the Fourth Amendment, right to a jury trial and so on, right right to, to, to be free of, uh, of being forced to incriminate yourself in a criminal case. I mean, there's a variety of rights that are listed quite clearly and quite broadly in the Bill of Rights. That's the first ten amendments that were passed as a package right after the Constitution as part of an overall political deal to pass the Constitution, but only if these first First Ten Amendments went with it. That was the deal, 1787 to 1791, and the First Ten Amendments passed as a package. The First Ten Amendments of the Constitution passed right after the Constitution was ratified, and it was a package. They were the First Ten Amendments. They are known collectively as the Bill of Rights. The Ninth Amendment is there because some of the people who were writing all this stuff, like James Madison, right, James Monroe, uh, President, uh, then George Washington and stuff, I mean, they were saying, hey, wait a second, down in the future out there, somebody could say, you know what, these fellas who wrote this thing, they said these are the important rights, and that's the end of the line, because if they wanted more rights, they could have written an 11th and a 12th and an 83rd Amendment. So the Ninth Amendment was a statement by the founders of this nation and the founding people who created America that just because we didn't list each and every right doesn't mean that this Bill of Rights is the final, exhaustive, end-of-line list of rights. That's what the Ninth Amendment's about. The Ninth Amendment simply says, we didn't say everything we meant to say in here. Don't think this is the end of the list. Feel free to make up some more. Which, incidentally dovetails perfectly into Roe versus Wade and the Obergefell versus Hodges case, marriage equality. Everybody knows Roe versus Wade. You don't have to say a woman's constitutional right to abortion when you say Roe versus Wade. But Americans are going to they're going to get familiar with the concept that Obergefell versus Hodges is marriage equality. And so the Ninth Amendment just says, look, just because we've listed these things doesn't mean that's the end of the list. That's the Ninth Amendment. Uh, and and so, Chris. Give me a try again. one 321 6001 are more impacted by what happens in our localities than we are about what happens in Syria or in Afghanistan. Because the truth of the matter is, if the street light at the corner where you go after you drive away from your, your home is busted, right, it's going to impact your day. If you flush the toilet and the sewer flows out into the street instead of working where it's the way it's supposed to, that's going to have a huge impact on your life. If the state regulator of the insurance industry in your state is incompetent or in, in the pocket of the insurance companies and your state's insurance car, I'm talking car insurance market, is totally out of control, then that's a state issue that's impacting you a lot. I urge you to consider going local. Identify the town you live in. Identify the city you live in. Identify who your elected local re representatives are. The same same thing on a state level. I trust you know who your, your governor is. Who's your state representative? Who's your state senator? Go local. I've got politics, civics, and you next where justice is served. Now, of course, it's time for one of my very favorite segments of all. We are not gays. Now, remember, whenever we start playing this, uh... 
We are not gays. See, they get the tail now added to it. We are not gays. Because they make such a really big point about how... We are not gays. <laughs> All right, so they I just want, you know, it's just, I take the Republicans at their words, right? We are not gays. Except for Larry Craig and so many other ones. But leaving all of that aside... Donald Trump is still leading in the polls, and now he perceives that one of the establishment guys, one of the establishment Republican candidates, actually may pose a threat to him. So Donald Trump is now attacking Marco Rubio. You have this, this clown, Marco Rubio. I've been so nice to him. Uh, but he's in favor of immigration, and he has been. He has been. It was the Gang of Eight, and you remember the Gang of Eight. It was terrible. And then he went down in the polls, and you have to stay. Uh, you know what, what? If you believe in something, you have to be true to yourself. You have to be. You have to be. But it was the Gang of Eight, and it was really, really, you talk about weak on immigration. Nobody weaker. He's talking about immigration reform when he, he's talking about the Gang of Eight. And, of course, that is Donald Trump. Donald Trump keeps going after Marco Rubio for his Gang of Eight activities. The Gang of Eight was a group in the United States Senate a couple of years back, four Democrats, four Republicans. And Marco Rubio was one of the four Republicans, right? Senator from Florida. Marco Rubio, one of the four Republicans who joined with uh, four Democrats to form the, the Gang of Eight, that core group of eight senators out of 100 negotiated what ended up being a very large, very, very thick document known as Comprehensive Immigration Reform. And it passed the Senate with Marco Rubio's support. Marco Rubio negotiated, initiate, firstly he initiated the discussions, then he was part of the leadership group that negotiated it, then he shepherded it through the U.S. Senate with his support and vote, a large proposed law that would have provided it a path to legalization for those here illegally. <laughs> now that's Marco Rubio and that's just a couple of years ago and that's why Donald Trump is now going after him on immigration because Donald Trump knows that the Republican Party crazy base that would be in love with Marco Rubio for his other nutty stands will turn their backs on Marco Rubio and treat him as just toxic waste because he was so weak on immigration. You have this, this clown, Marco Rubio. I've been so nice to him. Uh, but he's in favor of immigration, and he has been. He has been. It was the Gang of Eight, and you remember the Gang of Eight. It was terrible. And then he went down in the polls, and you have to stay. You know what? If you believe in something, you have to be true to yourself. You have to be. You have to be. But it was the Gang of Eight, and it was really, really, you talk about weak on immigration. Nobody weaker. Now, now, Donald Trump is making a calculation that Marco Rubio is vulnerable and big-time vulnerable on immigration because of his actions, as I've just outlined for you. We will see, but if the convention, the new, I should say, the new conventional wisdom holds, then Donald Trump ought to be able to knock out Marco Rubio just by using the immigration work that Marco Rubio did. Senator Rubio did the, the work he did in the Senate, used it against him. Because every time, every time the, the base of the Republican Party is reminded that these establishment types have done the very things that the base finds anathema, that the base turns on them. That's why Donald Trump is hitting Senator Rubio on immigration, because that's his most vulnerable spot. But, of course, with Donald Trump, you know, look, he just bashes on it as a general proposition. Senator Rubio is a lightweight. We understand that. He wouldn't be able to do this. He wouldn't know a trade deal from any other deal. Marco Rubio is a lightweight. I can't imagine that he goes anywhere. Who, by the way, has the worst voting record in the United States Senate. You have this, this clown, Marco Rubio. I've been so nice to him. Marco Rubio, he's like a kid. He shouldn't even be running in this race as far as I'm concerned. He's a kid. Marco Rubio, who has the worst voting record in the United States Senate. And a young guy, although he, he sweats more than any young person I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> now that's a double laughter. There's one of Krista's great montages of Donald Trump and Marco Rubio, so Krista gets the credit for that.
But here's here's the deal. Donald Trump understands that this is a race of outsiders versus insiders. And the outsiders are led by Trump, then Dr. Van Carson, and then Carly Fiorina. And the, so far, the only one that's even close as the establishment candidate is Senator Rubio. And that is why Donald Trump is now trying to destroy Senator Rubio. And it's interesting, we are still four months away four months before any votes are cast for the primaries or caucuses for president four months still and donald trump is talking about people dropping out now if i was like some of these people at one percent and two percent there's no reason to continue right. forward well there you go he's encouraging of course the the people who were at the bottom of the pack which is like most of them to, to get out and of course we already got a gift from god scott walker dropped out right that was clearly a gift from god that's obviously a sign that god's a democrat and that god did not want scott walker in so scott walker dropping out with more than four months to go before any votes are cast, that's a really interesting thing. And I brought you to the news earlier in the week that a lot of Jebbers, Jebbers top funders there, see we've got Jeb, the big money out there, but Jebbers top funders, they're very concerned about his low poll numbers. And so it is entirely possible, as much as I didn't think it would be, it is apparently entirely possible, and my analysis was wrong. i got to be fiercely independent. I didn't think any of these people would ever drop out because they all have personal billionaires. And, hey, they can, you can stay around with 2% and 5% in the polls because as long as you've got a personal billionaire paying the bills, why not? You never know what can happen. It turns out. The personal billionaires are a little more fickle than I gave them credit for. <laughs> I mean, that's really what has happened here. The billionaires get jittery feet, right? The, the billionaires uh, that are funding each of these candidates, what they do is they say, oh, no, look, he's tanking in the polls. He's not going anywhere. I'm throwing good money after bad. I'm not going to go anywhere with this guy. I'm not going to stay the course. That that was my mistake on the, on, the, on the billionaires, right? Because as long as you have a personal billionaire, you can stay in the race. We saw a lot of that in 2012, last time around. But now what we're seeing is the billionaires uh, basically uh, don't have a lot of stomach for this kind of game. They don't want to stay the course. They don't want to just keep pouring money in. So that's what happened with Scott Walker. His investors pulled out. Basically, his stock went to zero. <laughs> they, just, they sold off the asset that is Scott Walker and sold it at scrap. And Jebber's money people are now following suit. So... Donald Trump is not whistling Dixie when he says... If I was like some of these people at 1% and 2%, there's no reason to continue right. forward. There you go. That's Donald Trump, and he is encouraging these guys to get out. And, of course, why wouldn't he? And, by the way, Jebbers is now fighting back in his own in his own kind of low energy way. Donald seems to have a harder time taking criticism, and he probably needs to put on his big boy pants, too. <laughs> Boy, hey, Jebbers, if that's all you got, buddy, I, I got two words for you. Chicken crap. Uh, you know, you ain't going anywhere. If that's if that's your A material. Donald seems to have a harder time taking criticism, and he probably needs to put on his big boy pants, too. Yeah, well, Jebbers, uh, we know all about you and your pants. So. Chicken crap. There you go. All right, you get the rest of this hour, and I'm not kidding. I'm coming to you straight ahead. 1-888-321-6001. There is still more to come. We have a lot to do here today. Don't start your weekend just yet. But you are next. We're with Justice is Sir, the Norman Goldman Show. Norman. Yeah, you know, you're doing great. I've been about a two and a half year listener. Thanks. I'm loving it. And I just, you know, I just want to thank you for the knowledge. This is the Norman Goldman Show. Uh, the math is uh, the math. Math death. It's just a bad thing to, to do.